Let's bust into the Word. Uh, if you would, I want you to turn to Luke 8, 3. Today I'm preaching a message entitled, Risking It All. You know, there's three types of people. Uh, there's some people who just live for comfort. Unfortunately, in America, it has become maybe the sin of our nation because everybody lives for comfort. Uh, it, you know, the Bible says, actually, there's a scripture in the Old Testament that says, Woe to those who are at ease in Zion. Now listen, I'm all about resting in the Lord. I'm all about taking our burdens and giving them to Jesus. I certainly don't think that we should be living on a treadmill. But listen, there is also a place that we also live our lives for the glory of God and the souls of men. Amen? And so, um, but many people just live for comfort, just for whatever I can get out of life, comfort, ease. Uh, that's the motto of their life. There's other people who live for danger and risk it all, but sometimes in sinful ways. So, uh, hey, the man that has an affair on his wife uh, is risking it all. Uh, people who steal from their place of work or people who uh, do some incredibly terrible things. Uh, sometimes they're risking their whole life. And you may be here today, and you may be in a place where you're living at a place and you're risking it all. Can I just tell you, in Jesus' name, don't live there any longer. Uh, some people live for, for just adventure. When I was young, this was me. Everything was an adventure. There was no adventure that was too great. And so in preparing this, I thought, you know, I, I was actually uh, at a gas station and there was somebody pumping gas and smoking a cigarette. And I was thinking, that brother's risking it all right there, right? But I have a few other pictures. We have a few selfies. Uh, now, this lady is taking a selfie at a live erupting volcano. How do you know she's risking it all right there? Maybe not the brightest person on the planet. This uh, man is uh, with great white sharks, and he's taking a selfie in the ocean, and he's risking it all. Uh, the third one is, I, I think this picture is hilarious. He's running in the Pamplona in Spain. He's running from the bulls while he's taking a selfie of the bulls behind him. How do you know that brother's risking it all? And then here's my favorite, because it's a, it's a selfie with Jesus. If you've ever been or seen uh, in Rio de Janeiro, there is a hundred foot statue of Jesus that sits on top of a mountain. Uh, this guy wanted a selfie with Jesus. I love Jesus, but I don't know that I would go a hundred feet into the air. Uh, but he is risking it all to get his selfie with Jesus. Now, here's the point of the message today. And then the scripture is full of people who live their lives in such a way that they, they risk everything to serve God, to follow Christ, to do a work in the, in, in the day that they live. Rahab the harlot, she risked everything for the two spies and for the children of Israel. And she did it out of faith. The, Bible, the scripture says, because she believed that the God of Israel was the true living God, that she, uh, she put her trust in him and God spared her and her family because she risked it all. There's another king in the Old Testament. His name is Hezekiah. And uh, Sennacherib, which was the king of the Assyrian army, came and surrounded the city and basically said, hey, you belong to us, so give up. And Hezekiah risked everything. It's actually in the Assyrian writings in their empire where Sennacherib had written and said that, uh, that Hezekiah is like a, a bird in a cage and I'm about to crush him. But he didn't know the God that Hezekiah put his trust in. And Hezekiah trusted God. He risked everything and he believed God. And guess what? God destroyed that army and he brought deliverance to the children of Israel. But there was somebody who was willing to risk everything to serve God. In the, uh, in the New Testament, Luke chapter 8 and verse 3, there's a lady named Joanna. And she lived in Herod's household. Her husband was the steward of King Herod. Now, just to get this picture, King Herod is the guy who beheaded John the Baptist. He is the guy who mocked Jesus at the trial. And the, 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 his chief steward lives in the household. And the wife becomes a believer in Jesus. And she goes, okay, here's King Herod. But Jesus is the true king, and she put her trust and her hope in him and served God in the palace of Herod. Very little known to many people, don't, don't really speak a lot of Joanna, but she had a great impact in her world, and she served Jesus. She risked her life to serve Jesus. And here's my question to you today. To what extent would you go 
to fulfill the purposes of God. Now listen, you don't earn your salvation, so this has nothing to do with you being saved. But it has everything to do with the passion and the heart that you have to fulfill the purposes of God. And the person that I want to highlight today is the Apostle Paul. You know, in my, in my life, especially early on, I went to a lot of different churches. Presbyterian for a while, I was Methodist for a while, I was Baptist, Southern Baptist, Free Will Baptist. I went to all those churches. Uh, Assemblies of God, Church of God, Word of Faith there for a while. Now, uh, you know, before we started the church, interdenominational, and I like the place that I'm at. But you know, every single church that you go to, they go, oh, the Apostle Paul is great. I want to talk to you today about how and why Paul lived with the passion and the heart that he lived in. And what, you know, as I read the Apostle Paul, it strikes me, what was it that, that gave you the passion to reach the world that you lived in the way that you did. He's an extraordinary man. He is the greatest theologian that's ever lived. I believe that he is one of the brightest minds, not just in Christianity, but that has ever lived on the planet. He is the best church planter. You know, today everybody that plants a church wants to give away free movie tickets and you know wants to do free iPads and everything else. Listen, he didn't go with free iPads and movie tickets. He went with the glory of God and changed the world that he lived in and planted churches all over the place in a place that was very hostile, but he did it because he went by the book. And I wanna tell you that the Springs Church from day one, we planted the church the right way in the presence of God with the purposes of God. But Paul was the greatest evangelist, greatest missionary, you name it. What a great man of God. But what was it that drove him? What was it that was in his life that caused him to fulfill the purposes of God? Now in the Bible it says he's a chosen vessel. But I want you to look at your neighbor for a minute and just tell them, you are a chosen vessel. (laughs) So if you're here today and you know Jesus, guess what? You are a chosen vessel. God has called you to fulfill purposes in this world and he has his hand on your life. Now the question is this, and it's my prayer, God, I don't want to accomplish 50% of what you've called me to do, 70% of what you've called me to do, everything that you call me to do on this planet, I want to accomplish, and I'll probably miss miserably in many ways, but I can tell you this, my heart is I want to see God move, and I want to do the things that he's called me to do. Can somebody say amen? Amen. So what I want to look at today is what was the driving force in his life? We're going to start with this. Go to Acts chapter 9, verses 3 through 6. And the first thing I want you to see today is that he had a revelation. He had an encounter with Jesus. So the first thing is he had an encounter. Now, Tim Delina talks about this. Some of you may or may not know. But he, one of the things he talks about, good friend of mine, and uh, he, he was uh, preaching a few weeks ago, and he said some people have an experience with Jesus, and some people have an encounter with Jesus. I am convinced that a lot of people in America have had an experience with Jesus. They've come to the altar, they've said a prayer, they've gone back to their chair, uh, they got a selfie with the pastor, they got baptized, and they go, they've had an experience. But listen, the difference between an experience and an encounter, folks, I wanna tell you, God, we need an encounter with Jesus in the days that we live. The world is evil, there's a lot of brokenness around us, and there is depression. I mean, just, just look at the newspaper. Uh, I'm sorry, newspapers don't exist anymore. Just look at the TV, look on the computer, and you will see all of the wickedness and the brokenness that's around us. We need, we need to have an encounter with Jesus. And Paul here, if you would, in 9 and verse 3, it says he's, he journeyed, he's going to persecute Christians. He came near Damascus, and suddenly a light shone around him from heaven. He had an encounter with Jesus. He fell to the ground, and he heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Now look, here's the difference. When you have an experience with Jesus, you take a selfie. When you have an encounter with Jesus... You fall to your knees. And listen, there's some people that are here today, and I'm saying this in love. This is not judgmental. This isn't I'm better than you. This is 100%. There's some people in this room today and maybe watching online, and you need to have an encounter with Jesus. An experience is great, but listen, when you have an encounter, you fall to your knees. Look at the next thing that happens. It says, and then he says, who are you? And the Lord said, I'm Jesus, 
whom you're persecuting because when you persecute my bride, you persecute me. It's hard for you to kick across uh, uh, against the goads. And so he trembling and astonished said, Lord, what do you want me to do? Here's the second thing when you have an encounter with God first, you fall to your knees. The second thing, if you want to go, how do I know if I've had an experience with Jesus or an encounter with Jesus? When you have an encounter with Jesus, all of a sudden it's not like, oh, am I going to heaven or not? It moves from that and you move to the place where you say, God, what is it that you want me to do? Because anything you want me to do, God, I'll do it. That's an encounter. That is an encounter with God. And there's a lot of people, and I say this politely, but there's a lot of people out there that are just like, hey, uh, maple biscuits, by the way, why did you not ask me to preach on Wednesday? I can come back. Okay, very good. Maple biscuits. Man, this church is moving forward, right? So, but there's a lot of people that come for a maple biscuit. We got the best bouncy houses and nothing wrong with any of that. But folks, only when you've had an encounter with Jesus, but you can have all of the trappings of religion and church and everything else. But if you've not had an encounter with Jesus, you are missing the greatest thing about Christianity. It's not our biscuits. It's not our donuts. It's not our home fellowship groups. It is the presence of Jesus and having an encounter with him. And he says, what do you want me to do? And then, and then in verse 8, then Saul arose from the ground. And when his eyes were opened, he saw no one. It meant he was blind. But they led him by hand and brought him to Damascus. And he was three days without sight and neither ate nor drink. When you have an encounter with Jesus, it begins to turn your whole world around. You move from a place of comfort. You move from a place of entertainment. You move from a place of everything is about me. And what happens with Paul is he goes from this place and he begins to move in such a way that his world is turned upside down. And church, I want to say this to you. The beginning of the Christian life begins with having an encounter with Jesus. I love you. Listen, I'm, I'm saying this today because I love you. But the greatest thing that, you can, that can happen today, I don't care where you've come from, how you've lived, or where you're at, but when you have an encounter with Jesus, he really can change everything. It's not just words to a song. He really can change everything. And so the first thing is important to have an encounter. When you have an encounter with Jesus, you want to be like him. You know, um, Krista, uh, I love my wife. And knowing her has really changed my life. Uh, today I was, I was checking out of the hotel. I'm going to be dra- driving back to Tampa. I flew in and out of there because my mom had surgery. And so I had to check out of the hotel. And when I was younger, before I met Krista, it was like, just leave the place. What, however it is, I'm getting somebody. But now with Krista, she won't leave the, the hotel room like that. Like, and so this morning I woke up and I go, I got to do it Krista's way. So all the trash is thrown away. I make the bed back up. And I'm like, but that's the Krista way, right? She impacted my life. And here's what I'm saying, is that when you have an encounter with Jesus, it will change the way that you live and behave and walk and what you do. And listen, completely imperfect at times. But we know that he is the one that we search and we seek. He had an encounter with Jesus, and Jesus changed his life. Here's the second thing that happened with Paul, is that Paul had a revelation of God's word. I want you to go with me to Galatians chapter 1. We're actually going to go backwards in the passage, so we're going to start kind of towards the end of chapter, um, of chapter 1, and we're going to work our way back, which means go with me to verse 18. So after he has this encounter uh, with Jesus, you would think that he would go hang out with the apostles, but he says in verse 18, after three years, uh, I went to Jerusalem to see Peter and remained with him for 15 days. So he didn't go immediately. What he did was this, is he went, he went back to his prayer closet. He went back to the word of God. And he was like, okay, okay, Jesus, I've had this encounter with you, but now I want to see what your word says. This is really important because he didn't want just the apostles to tell him. He, want, he went to God and asked for a revelation of the word. Now, I want you to get this straight, especially for some of you young guys that are called to ministry, right? He's probably one of the most intelligent people that's ever lived. 
He was a Hebrew of the Hebrews, a Pharisee of the Pharisees. Many people believe that he was in the Sanhedrin. He knew the Old Testament like nobody else. It was the easiest thing to just pick up the book and go uh, begin to speak uh, about the truths in the Old Testament because he was an orator. He was a speaker. But listen, he had so much mixed up about the Bible. You know, there's a lot of people that can quote scriptures, but they don't have a revelation of the word. Go to homeless ministry. Itzia was in the first service. You go to homeless ministry, and you will actually have drug addicts. You'll have alcoholics that will recite to you the Bible, but they don't have a revelation of God's word. There are people who sit in church week after week, year after year, and they, they can quote to you scriptures, and they can go to you books in the Bible, but they have never had a revelation of God's word. Church, I want to tell you, Paul had a revelation of God's word, and it radically changed the way that he lived, how he operated, what drove him to do the things that he did. Uh, go with me to verse 12. It says, I neither receive this revelation from man, uh, nor was I taught it, but it came through the revelation of Jesus Christ. Uh, go back to verse 6. Now, he's talking to people who have mixed law and grace together. And he goes back in verse 6, and he says this, I marvel that you're so turning away from him who calls you from the grace of Christ to a different gospel, which is not another, but there are some who trouble you and want to pervert the gospel of Christ. And I want to tell you, if 2,000 years ago, people were perverting the gospel and they had revelations that were not the, the full revelation of Jesus, how many know that it still exists today? There are people that still don't have the revelation right. They know words, they know scriptures, they know uh, Bible things that they can point to you, but they have never had a revelation of what the grace of God means. And this is what happened to Paul. He had a revelation of what the grace of God is. Listen, you can quote the scripture all day, but when you realize that the grace of God is something that God wants to change your life with and he wants to reveal in your spirit, it will absolutely re, uh, it re reorganize all of your priorities and he will do this incredible work. He goes on to say, which is not another, but there's some of you who trouble and they, they want to pervert the gospel of Christ. But even if we or an angel from heaven preach another gospel to you, then what has been preached, let him be accursed. I, go, go with me to Philippians. I don't think it'll come up on the screen, uh, but I, I want you to, this is, this is uh, Paul's revelation in a nutshell. In chapter Philippians 3 and verse 7, many of you may be familiar with this, but he says, but the things that were gained to me, those I have counted lost for Christ. Can I tell you a revelation? Man, we, in every pulpit in America, every pastor, every leader in this church, one of the first things that you begin with the revelation is it is not about me. He starts with this place of going, I have no agenda. There's nothing that I want to create or do in and of myself. And listen, too often we have created heroes in the body of Christ. Can I tell you, there are no heroes in the body of Christ. There is one hero, and his name is Jesus, and he is Lord and King of all, right? And Paul comes to this place and he realizes, hey, this is not about me. Anything that were gained to me is lost for Christ. Yet indeed, I also count all things lost for the excellence of the knowledge of Christ Jesus, my Lord, whom I have suffered the loss of all things, which means, hey, I risk everything every day of my life. I die daily, and Jesus recreates something you and me. I've suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having my own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which is from God by faith, that I might know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his suffering being conformed to his death. I want you to, I want to just break this down for a minute and I want you to, to see something in the life of Paul. He has this great encounter with Jesus and then he starts going to the word. Now his life, he was a legalist. He was a person who had lived by the law. He had tried in his best effort and his, the, the best that he could put forward to be a good guy, to keep the law, 
because he was trying to please God. Everything inside of him is that Jewish man was going, I keep the 623 laws and this produces some kind of righteousness in me. And here's the truth. When he came to the revelation of the grace of God, he discovered it is not about how good I am. It is about how good Jesus is. It is completely by his grace. Now listen, you can say those words, but I want you to move from the place of being able to say, you know, you've been saved by grace through faith, not, not, not of yourselves, it's the gift of God. Can you move from that place to go, I understand that the grace of God means that through all of my effort and goodness and law keeping, I can never please God, but Jesus went to a cross and he died and I have no righteousness of my own. My righteousness is found in the person of Jesus and that became a revelation to him. And the result of that is now I live by faith. And folks, let me, so you're clear with this because you gotta have this before you walk out of the room today. He's, 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 he comes to this place and he goes, man, there's such a passion. I had this encounter with Jesus and now I understand his word and all of the law keeping of the Old Testament will never save me. I need to know Jesus and I need to know the grace of God and now I live by faith, which is not just a uh, quoting a few scriptures. Living by faith means that I trust him and I love him and I cleave to him and he's my Lord and he's my God. And when you begin to live like that and you die to self, the power and the life of Jesus begins to work through you. And here's one of the reasons. We're gonna go to the next, to the next thing. But this is what happened with him when he had this encounter and God began to show this to him. All of a sudden the passion in his heart goes, Man, there are so many people that are lost, that, are, that have this idea of God as the law keeper. The lost people think that God is up there with judgment, with a, with a, with a, uh, with a bat to hit them over the head when they fail. And then you have other people who live lasciviously and just do whatever they want and they live in sin and they think that there's no God at the end and both of them are wrong. But he goes, when you understand the grace of God and what it is to live by faith, he has this revelation and it's so deep in his life that he goes, I want people to know this. Can I just say this as well? He had a revelation at the road of Damascus, but it wasn't the last revelation that he had. And there's some of you that are here and you remember your salvation experience and you go, hey, I had a revelation of Jesus. But can I tell you that there's many places and times that God wants you to have a revelation of his presence outside of just getting saved? I could point to you the time I went to Ireland as a missionary. When we started the church here, uh, man, it was, hard. it was like all hell came against me. I met with Carter Conlon, and he was like, all hell is coming against you? And I was like, yeah, Pastor Carter, you just don't know what I'm going through right now. You know what he said back to me? You're in the perfect place. Because it's in your weakness that God reveals his power. And church, I want to tell you, it, it's life-changing when you begin to understand what grace and by faith means, and you have a revelation of Jesus, and you're beginning to have this encountering time with him. And so, so you go, now we're going to go to the last point here, which is this, is risking it all. Paul risking everything. And here's what I want you to see. Why did he live with such a passion? He lived with such a passion because he knew what it was to live a law-based life. He knew what it was to live without the grace of God, to try more and more effort to please God. And at the end of it, he failed over and over again. And when he goes through the scriptures and he understands that the Bible says that Abraham was declared righteous by faith apart from his works, now you go through and you read what the Apostle Paul says uh, uh, about serving God and living for God, and it begins to transform your understanding of who Jesus is and what the revelation of that word, and he gets this in his heart, and he's going, man, I want everybody to know about Jesus. And church, I want to just, this is just a, a hey, just asking the question, I'm not judging anybody, but when you have an encounter with Jesus, and you have a revelation of his word, I'm gonna tell you there is something so powerful that begins to stir in your heart that you want other people to have the same encounter and the same revelation of his word. And listen, that's the heart of God for where we live today. So Paul has this encounter, he has this revelation. Go with me to 2 Corinthians eleven twenty-two 22 through 30. 
I don't even have to, I won't read all of it. You can go through and see it. This has been, I, I want to tell you, for the last six months, ever since I took the role at World Challenge, I've been studying the life of Paul. And I've been asking myself, like, man, how does that dude keep doing it? Like, I'm about to read this. I don't know how he kept going. And I would read it and go, listen, I was a missionary for eight years. We started a church from seven people to what the church is today. And thank God for the new building and everything else. And it has been such an amazing journey. But it has, you know, it's been difficult at times. And I go, how did this guy do what he did? And I'll tell you why. Because it will help you in the place that you're called. Because he had an encounter with Jesus. And he had a revelation of God's word. And it began to move him for the people that were around him. So this is what it says in 1 Corinthians eleven twenty-two. 22. I was in prison. He says, I had countless beatings. I can't even count how many times I was beaten. You know, can I just tell you, anybody ever been beat up? You know, I kind of became, you know, played college football and bounced bars. But when I was younger, I got bullied a few times. Anybody here ever been beat up? I've been beat up. You get somebody on top of you, and they're slapping you around and hit you in the face, and like, I'm going, I don't like that. Can somebody say amen? <laughs> I don't want to be beat up. Paul says, I have countless times. I can't even count how many times I've been beaten up. Not because, you know, I was, you know, stole somebody's lunch money, but I was beaten because I was telling people about the love and the power of Jesus. Five times, I had 40 lashes minus one. I'm going to tell you, one time you lashed me 39 times, I'm kind of looking for a way to get out of that. And you're going, five times? 40 lashes minus one? Three times I was beaten with rods, that sticks. I was stoned and left for dead. And I think most of you know the story. After he was stoned outside the city and left for dead, God raised him up. And he went back to the same city that just stoned him. And you're going, are you just crazy or foolish or glutton for punishment? You're risking it all, but maybe you're just not too bright of a guy. No, he was one of the brightest people that ever lived. And then it says he was shipwrecked, rejected by his critics, the Gentiles, the Romans, the Greeks, the Jews. He even said the people that I thought were my friends rejected me, but I kept going. You know how many people come to church and somebody doesn't shake their hand or they're not nice to them. And they're like, I quit. I'm out of here. This man was beaten time after time after time. And I go, how did you get up and keep going? And if you don't get this, you're going to miss a lot about what it means to serve God. Because he had an encounter with Jesus. And he had a revelation of the word. And he was like, you're probably going to beat me today. But I know there's a few people out there that are going to come to have an encounter with Jesus. So you know what? They're probably going to beat me today. I'm probably going to get the lashes. But I am so passionate because I know what Jesus did in my life when I had an encounter with him. And I began to look through this word. And it wasn't just words in a page like it was for so many years as I was that Pharisee of Pharisee and, uh, you know, uh, when I lived my life, a Hebrew of Hebrews, and I could quote all the scriptures to you, but I had no revelation of God and his word and his plan for my life. But when he came to the understanding, he was like, yeah, I'm probably going to get beaten today. They're probably going to throw me in prison, probably going to get lashed, may get beaten with rods, but nothing is going to keep me from telling people about the love of Jesus Christ. You know, one of the privileges that I have at World Challenge Mark Renfro, one of those great missionaries, he's been to the church here before, and we hired him. His heart, my heart, Gary Wilkerson's heart, is to take the gospel to unreached people groups. And we know as soon as you take the gospel to an unreached people group, you will, you will create the persecuted church. Because as soon as the gospel goes where people don't like Jesus, they will persecute. And you know how many people that I've come in contact that I know that work with us that will go into towns and villages knowing that when they go there, there's a good chance that they could be killed that day for the gospel. And you go, why do you do that? Because they had an encounter with Jesus and a revelation of his word. And he's going, yeah, they could kill me, but somebody may get saved. Church, that is so contrary to where the church in America is at. And I want to say this is not guilt. This is, I mean, like that's a million miles away. 
But church, we have sat in our comfort zones for so long that we've forgotten what it is to live with a passion. And here we are, church. Man, you, you got to know how much I love this church family. You are coming into a place under Pastor Owen and the leadership that's here. You have got incredible pastors and leaders, and I know their hearts. And their heart is to reach this world. But you're about to go from the place that you're at. You're going to go into a new facility. There's going to be a lot of attention and attraction. But I want to tell you, it's got to be more than the mortar and the bricks. It has to be more than the cafe. Can I just tell you this? The cafe was one of my ideas, by the way. I love my coffee. And you're going to have good coffee. Can I tell you something real quick? So we're in uh, Colorado, and we're kind of looking for a church that we'll belong to while we're there. And so Krista comes a- a- across the church. She's like, oh, this looks interesting. And then she looks at their values. The first value was, and this is a quote. So I can, can I say a quote from the pulpit? And you're like, what's the quote? We don't have crap coffee. That was their first value. Well, then we looked at the, then we looked at the, they had little, uh, like, you know, uh, like people had um, responses where they had come to the church. And one lady goes, yeah, I went to church there. They didn't open the Bible. They didn't talk about the Bible. There's a lot of stories, a lot of illustrations. And I'm going, that's where a lot of the church is at today, unfortunately. It's stories, it's quips, it's, but listen, it is a revelation of God's word. And it is an encounter with Jesus that our culture needs. And folks, listen, just because you go into the new cool building isn't going to suffice what this city needs. Man, we're in Colorado Springs right now. And you got to know this, I'm traveling a lot of places and speaking and thank God for the opportunities that I have there. But you know what? I still have this burden for this city. I want you, want, want you to look with this. I'm gonna, I'll, this will be my second closing. Uh, go to Romans chapter 9. It's before the third closing. Paul actually has to say that he's telling the truth a couple of times. You know why? Because it's so crazy. You're going, now you're lying. If it's not writ- written by the inspiration of the scripture, I literally would look at this passage and go, Come on, Paul. Like, really? You're just kind of, you know, you're just kind of saying. You're like, really? It's that crazy. And when you look at it in context, it's crazy stuff. This is a crazy passage in the Bible. Romans chapter 9, verse 1. I tell you the truth in Christ. He had to say that because he knew nobody would believe him. I am not lying. He had to say it twice. And then he says, my conscience also bearing witness in the Holy Spirit. So he goes, three times he tells you what I'm about to tell you is not a lie. Why? Because we're all going to think, like, come on, Paul, you're not Superman. And then he says this. He says that I have great sorrow and continual grief in my heart. Now, the word that he uses here is not that I do wish. He says, for I could wish that I myself were a curse from Christ for my brethren, my countrymen, according to the flesh. I want to just tell you, that's crazy. A curse from Christ means you're not going to heaven. And he goes, there's places that the, that the love that I have for people to have an encounter with the Jesus that I've had an encounter with and to understand the revelation of his word is so intense for the people that God has called me to that I almost could. Uh, he doesn't cross the line and say that he does. I could almost see myself being accursed so that they would find the grace and the mercy and the love of God. Church, I want to bottle that up in my heart. I want to go, God, can you give me something that's half of that burden? Youth group, man, do you, are you burdened for the people that you go to school with every day? You go to college, people around you, atheist, agnostic, every form of thinking in this world, and they've never had an encounter with Jesus? And they don't have a revelation of his word. Are you here today and you go to work and you're in neighborhoods and you go, like, it doesn't really bother me that much? Church, we got to awaken to this. We have to somewhere, we have to stop and go, hey, this guy was the greatest missionary, greatest, all that. He was chosen. But God, you've chosen me here to Orange Park in the greater Jacksonville area. And God, can you give me that passion? Because listen. If this church catches that, I will tell you, you talk about a spiritual awakening in your city, in your church, that will create it. That'll do the job. 
too many of us, we like our comfort. We like our isolation. We like our comfortable places. And I think that God is speaking to the church in these last days. And he's saying, who's ready to risk everything so that somebody else can have an encounter with Jesus? So somebody else can have a revelation of his word. There are people that are so religious all around you every day. And when they hear, when they hear Christians, it's all law-based. This is what's right. This is what's wrong. Hey, listen, I'm against abortion. But, listen, but if, if everything that you're speaking to the lost world is about abortion and LTBGQ community, and that's what, that's what they hear out of your mouth, they're going to go law-based. But dear God, if they could ever have a revelation, a, a real an encounter with Jesus and a revelation of his word and who he is, it will change their life. We have to move from the way that they think God is to who God really is. And the only way that that will happen is when it comes to the vessel that is sitting in your chair. It's you and it's me where Christ revealed to the world that surround us. Father God, I pray, Lord, in this house, Lord, that you would give us a fresh encounter with the person of Jesus Christ. God, I pray today that there would be a revelation that grips our heart, that God, that we would be so enamored with the love and the grace and the power of God, that Lord, it would be a fire shut up in our bones, God, to take this message and to share with people who are broken and lost, to think that God is this law-based God that's ready to hit them over the head when they do wrong, but God, they've never had a revelation of Jesus. Lord, I pray that we would live in such a way, Lord, that they would know of the grace and the mercy and the love of God and the power of God and faith, God, that moves mountains. God, I pray, Lord, that we would live like that in the days that we exist. Lord, you have called your bride in these days, God, to stand as a witness for your glory. Not just Pastor Owen, not just the pastoral staff, but every person in this church family. God, give us an encounter with Jesus and a revelation of your word. Hallelujah. Church, can you stand? I, listen, I can't, we, I can't manufacture this. I literally, I'm going to ask you to come to the altar. Anybody that can, if you can make your way. But as you come to the altar today, if you're here today and you go, hey, I want to have a revelation with Jesus, I just want you to know this. I can't manufacture that. You can't manufacture that. But what you can do today is go, God, I want to live my life in such a way that as the scripture says, I die daily and I live for this encounter with Jesus. And Lord, I pray that as I have this encounter, that you would give me a revelation of your word that pours out to the world that I live in. Church, over the next few months, man, you're going you're gonna to drive to the new church property and you may have to walk across the street for parking. You may go to a place and the nursery is not ready yet or the children's church isn't ready yet or your coffee bar isn't ready yet. And can I just tell you, if, if you're into this and it's all about your comfort, it's never going to last. But dear God, if there's a group of people that say, I have encountered Jesus and I have come to a revelation of his word and his power, that's life changing. God, I want that. God, I pray, Lord, that you would put in my heart. God, to live in such a way, Lord, that I have an encounter with the God of the universe. Jesus, we love you. God, these are people that I love. God, this is a church family, God, that, Lord, we pray for and believe God for. And I thank you, God, for Pastor Owen and Pastor Matt and, God, the entire team that's here. But, God, I pray, Lord, that men and women would have an encounter with you and a revelation of your word. And, God, I pray, Lord, that, Lord, it would amaze us. It would astound us, God, the things that you do in this house, Lord, in the coming days and weeks and years. God, I pray today, God, that you would bring, God, this revelation, God, to your people right where you're at just begin to hey maybe just begin to purpose in your heart god i know I, I need an encounter with you i've had an experience but i've never fallen to my knees and said god whatever you want and maybe today and maybe in the next days and weeks that maybe as god begins to stir your heart i know this when you come to him in faith he will never neglect you he will never turn away from you you come to him in faith and he is ready to meet you in the place that you're at God, I pray, Lord, that you would move by your power and, Lord, by the greatness of your Holy Spirit, God, in this house. Jesus, praise God.